Okay, welcome back to another sack, sack to sack cast. Um, in, a, in a still ghostly deserted um, Iron Goat Brewery. Well, there's a few more people here. All this, all these last week. week. <laughs> this, this whole week later, still, still no one here. But um, yeah, this week we're uh, talking about a different movie that Isaac picked. So, what, what are we talking about? But I burp first. Beer is delicious. Okay, we're talking about the 1979 Hideo Gosha film Hunter in the Dark. It is a, I guess you'd call it a Chanbara film, right? Yeah, it's pretty, well, yeah. Yakuza pretty is kind of Yakuza. its own genre. But we're talking about late 1700s Yakuza. Yeah. Old school. Old school. OG Yakuza. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk about Hideo Gosha first. So Hideo Gosha, I guess, got his start in television in Japan. Mm-hmm. And uh, he had a television show called Three Outlaw Samurai. And apparently that film impressed the heads of Shochiko Films so much that they offered him to adapt it into a feature, which was his first feature in 1964. Yeah, I've heard of that movie. It's black and white. Uh, I know Criterion has it available. Um, it's pretty good. I think it's on Hulu Plus. Mm-hmm. Um, it's about three outlaw samurai. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> you can imagine how that goes. Ends up with, you know, some awesome swordplay action. I think that was actually adapted into a... Um Hong Kong kung fu movie called uh, um, shit heroic. Uh, so far, that's a terrible name for a movie. No, it was it was similar. It was like three heroes or something. Yeah, three, I want to say was, heroic trio, but that's a movie starring women from the nineties. So it was three ninjas. Is what you're thinking of? No, no. <laughs> God damn it! But the first Hideo Gosha film I saw was his second film. It was called Sword of the Beast, and it came in this Criterion box set of four samurai classics, and of the four. That is the one I liked the least, Hmm. but I think it's because it was the most kind of, not not campy, that's not the right word for it, but the most like overtly, let's give people what they want kind of movie. Let's let's have some, let's have some gratuitous, gratuitous violence, gratuitous nudity. Um, And I guess at the time, compared to the other three, there was uh, Kihachi Okamoto's Kill with Uh uh, Tatsuya Nakadai, which I love, one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, Samurai Rebellion, which is a... Masaki Kobayashi it had uh, Toshiro Mifune in it yeah and that one's pretty good and then the other one I'm totally blanking on because it was just forgettable I guess mm-hmm. but this one always kind of like I was like I was kind of bummed it wasn't as good as I, I wanted it to be but uh, recently because of Hulu Plus they have a bunch of Hideo Gosha on there with this the deal they've got with with Criterion and so I, I saw one title by Hideo Gosha called Bandits vs. Samurai Squadron and just on the title alone, I was like, I have to see this movie. <laughs> I did. I loved it. And so I started well, isn't kind of... Ba- isn't that basically the plot outline of Seven Samurai? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, I guess it is, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Bandits vs. Uh, Samurai Squadron is a lot similar to Hunter in the Dark. It's about rival clans uh-huh. and how you know they go back and forth. And then uh, Hunter in the Dark was the immediate follow-up to that. And um, you know, what to say about this one? It, it starts out with like a, a story scroll, a history scroll, talking yeah. about you know what the... The nature of politics was like in the, you know, it was like 1780s, I think. Yeah, yeah. Talking about the, you know, shogunate was just so corrupt that, it, like, um, the palace or whatever was just a nonstop barrage of people coming with bribes trying yeah, to yeah, get a was, favor. Um, from what I understand, it was during one of those times of, of peace in Japan where everyone was just kind of bored. And so all the political corruption and stuff mm-hmm. went underground instead of being overt and militaristic. Yeah. Yeah, put a happy face on it. Yeah, yeah. And so after after that history scroll, um, it cuts to it's nighttime. It's through a village. You've got this dude sleeping in a hut. Another guy running up to it, knocking on it, and you see this guy with one eye. Well, he's he's got he doesn't have an eye patch or anything. He just has a scar across his forehead, and, and his his left eye is permanently shut. He gets up. He ties a piece of paper around his face. Gets his sword, and he's he's there with. You know, what you find out later is, I guess, a prostitute. Yeah. And they go down the river, and they ambush these two palanquins. And the, the guy who, who knocked on this guy's, the, the Bronin's door, said it's the first one. you got to get the first one. And he, he sharpens a stick of bamboo, and at the right moment, shoves it up through the bridge, climbs up the bridge, and just is an all-out assault. Assault on uh, 
this palanquin. And the guy in the second palanquin gets out. It's Tatsuya Nakadai, who is, I don't know, becoming, I think, my favorite Japanese actor. He's, a, he's incredible. He's awesome. He's, I, he's, I haven't seen a bad performance from him. No, he's always good, but you always know it's him. Yeah. Whereas, like, with Toshiro Mifune, who I think would probably be the ultimate Japanese actor, because he just disappears into roles. And, he, like, I've seen so much of his performances that it's, like, it's different every time. I'm like, I have no idea who you are as a real person. Mm-hmm. Whereas I feel like Tatsuya Nakadai has always got this regalness to him. Yeah. I, I don't know. With, with Mifune, I feel like he's very good at more theatrical, like, kind of exaggerated roles. Oh, sure. I mean, he I kind of brought that to Japanese cinema. Yeah. I, I don't, and I, and I, I feel that Nakadai is capable of more styles of acting. Yeah. Like, I remember seeing an interview more with More restrained. Him. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, see, I remember seeing an interview with him on, I think it was the Kagamusha extras on, mm-hmm. the, on the Criterion release of that, where they were interviewing him, and he was talking about how he has to change his style of acting depending on what director he's working with. So he was like, if I'm in a, a Kurosawa movie, I have to talk more formally. And, like, he, he went into that kind of mode of speaking where it was mm-hmm. more you know, like theatrical almost. And he's like, but if I'm in a movie like by Yasujiro Ozu or someone where I have to be more understated. And he, and he, he switched from like between both modes right. in just the space of a few seconds. And it was really incredible to watch. Yeah, that, and that's an interesting point. With Mifune, he's, it's essentially the same style. I mean, he disappears into his roles, but it's still the same style. Yeah, but with, yeah, with Nakadai, that's true. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's just because he's got that look. Kind of like a, an Edward Norton or a, a Ryan Gosling, where yeah. you you still see the actor, but they're, yeah. they're kind of still. It, it's like really his, well. his his he has that level of like natural charisma that it kind of overpowers yes. a lot of things. I think, yeah. I think it's, yeah, that's what I mean by that. You know, even even someone like Steve Buscemi, who's a really talented actor that, that's capable of lots of different roles, you you always know it's Buscemi because he's so himself. Yeah. you know, he has that singular look about him. But yeah. Yeah, so we see Tatsu Nakadai. Um, there's a, a lamp that is set on fire that plays a, a big role later on. That um, oh, What's his name? The guy with the one eye. The actor's name. Oh, Yoshio Harada. Harada. Yes. Yeah, he's staring at it, and Nakadai is like, why are you staring at the lantern? And he turns, and the Nakadai actually takes out one of the guys charging towards the guy with one eye. Because mm-hmm. I think he smells a good future with this guy. Mm-hmm. Um... But yeah, so the movie's mostly about yeah. the relationship between this this hired sword and this yakuza boss, and how that develops and ruins everyone's lives. Essentially, yeah. I mean, like with a lot of period pieces. Well, let me. Uh, here's from the Wikipedia page about about Gosha. So around this time, late seventies uh, into the eighties, Gosha began making period films that featured prostitutes as protagonists that were renowned for their realism violence and overt sexuality they were critically panned for those very reasons but they were also box office successes which makes sense to me because this movie is fucking awesome yeah it really is it's (laughs) it's really good but i can understand why it's it would be panned critically because there's really i mean it's 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 historical Mm -hmm. i mean this 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 kind of stuff actually happened i mean none of the characters are real but this is like portraying a real period of history um I guess, should we go further into the plot? I don't think it's that important. Um, it, it, okay, I was really when it, when I you you told me to watch this movie and I, I punched it in the old computer and once it came up I was like oh shit this is this is totally in my wheelhouse mm-hmm. because I've watched tons like if if I specialized in any period of Japanese cinema it would be like seventies to early 80s. Right, which has until now been kind of my blind spot. Like, yeah. essentially, my Japanese film his knowledge is from... I've gotten as far back into, like, the early 30s with Naruse and Ozu, and mm-hmm. then into the, the 40s and 50s with Kurosawa, into the 60s with all of the, uh, you know, Nakatsu Noir stuff, and, yeah. you know, Seijin Suzuki. But my only foray past, like, 1970 is just a couple of Oshima films. Yeah. And then maybe into more recent stuff with uh, some Mike, some... I guess that's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, this movie was loaded with actors that I had recognized yeah. from other things. Um, the villain in the movie is Sonny Chiba, mm-hmm. who plays a kind of a corrupt government official. Um, but he was a little more ambiguous. I yeah, think, he than wasn't. Evil. He wasn't overtly evil. Like he had right. his own motivations, and he wasn't necessarily any worse than anyone well, it's like else. He in the movie. saw where this whole yakuza lifestyle was going, and. Yeah. 
saw an opportunity to rid himself of it mm-hmm. and and kind of wash his hands of it and then capitalize on its demise. Yeah. But um, it also, um, though I couldn't spot him in the movie, this is supposedly the first film of Koji Yakusho, mm-hmm. who is, um, you saw 13 Samurai. He was yeah. the leader of the 13 okay, Samurai. Sure. Um, he's also been in a lot of recent um, Kiyoshi Kurosawa movies, who's Which one of my anything of. favorite uh, mo- modern Japanese directors. Um, he was in Babel. He, he played okay. Rinko Kikuchi's dad in Babel. Um, so I've only actually seen him as, as like an older middle-aged man in movies. Mm-hmm. So um, supposedly this is his first movie, and I couldn't spot him in it. Hmm. Um, so Maybe he hasn't aged well. Well, he was just too young. Like, well, He's one of those guys that has like a really distinct kind of craggy, sunken mm-hmm. face. You know, that's, that's you know... But this, this was before he was craggy. Though. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it was it was harder to spot. Um, I'll have to watch it again and see if I can't find him. But mm-hmm. um, and Yoshio Harada, who plays the one eyed assassin Roman, yeah. guy, yeah, uh, was he, it, uh, T- um, Tokigawa is that, is that the character's name? Something like that. Something like that. Yeah. Who cares? <laughs> I, I just that's, seriously that's, with, with movies like this, I just know the characters by the actors that play. Yeah, them. by the face. Yeah. I, that's been a struggle for me with Japanese <laughs> cinema is because the names are they kind of blend into the rest of the language. Yeah. So when I'm reading subtitles, like the, this is the second time I've seen it, I tried to, not, I guess memorize, like associate the name I'm seeing on the subtitle with the character. Mm-hmm. And it's still difficult. I can't pull any names, yeah. except maybe uh, Nakadai's character was Gomyo. Yeah. Because that was kind of an unusual name, I thought. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's easier in like, uh, like a, a Kurosawa, like Ron or something, where they keep addressing the king by name or something. Right. So it's super kinda, formal. Yeah, you hear it's it in over and over and over. But anyway, Yoshio Harada, um, he was kind of a middle middle grade star in in like the seventies through the eighties in mostly these kind of period Yakuza movies. Mm-hmm. Um, he had a he had a role, a supporting role in the second Lady Snowblood film, I believe. You've told me about those. And he's there is a. Tr- I want to say a trilogy of revenge movies that he starred in in the earlier 70s that were released in the States. But I know him primarily from his more recent work. Um, and I think he actually died uh, like two years, a year or two ago. Um, but I know him from his more recent work, um, most importantly from a movie called Onibi, The Fire Within, from 1997, I want to say. And that is... Uh, kind of the uh it's a yakuza movie that's kind of post yakuza sort of you know mm-hmm. kind, kind of like unforgiven's a western that kind of tears apart sure western like a, a post yeah, yeah it's it's sort of like that and it's directed by one of one of my uh favorite modern japanese directors named rokuro mochizuki who started out as a hardcore pornography director in the 80s <laughs> who actually was able to transition into uh, into legitimate films, interesting, and and got some like recognition on the festival circuit. But this movie, Ona Be the Fire Within, he play uh, Harada plays kind of a washed up yakuza guy who went to jail a lot of years ago for for carrying out a hit for his boss. Because apparently in the yakuza world, they have these guys that they keep around. They don't make them do any work or anything. They keep them around because they know that they're capable of murdering someone for them. Mm -hmm. So when the time comes that they need someone killed, they're like, okay, it's on now go kill that guy and do your time in prison or whatever. So it's about this guy getting out of prison and having to adjust to his life and, and deal with the the guilt over what he did and all that sort of thing. Interesting. Now, which one was that? It's called own be the fire within. It was released on the, it looks like uh 2000. Uh, no, sorry. 97, 97. Yeah. I was looking up his filmography now. Yeah, he died two years ago. Yeah, yeah. And he was, um, after that, he was in one of Toshiaki Toyota's movies uh, called Nine Souls about a prison break where he kind of played a very similar role Mm -hmm. to his role in Onabi, except that he was trying to reconnect with his his daughter. Which you realize you brought that up last episode. Yeah, yeah. Um, (laughs) But, and then he's had other roles in, um, I, I think he was in... I think he was in the Azumi movies, or at least one of them. Um, but yeah, pretty prolific. Looks he, like he's he, got, he had uh, kind of a fallow period in in the later '80s and early '90s, but he kind of 
weaseled his way back into the industry in the mm-hmm. later 90s and 2000s until his uh, sad well, According demise. to IMDb, he's got 133 acting credits. Yeah. Um, so. so he he's Which, actually one of my one of my favorite actors, so I was, I was elated that he was in this. Yeah, I recognized him. Um, which is why, I mean, I just admitted he has this a very before, distinct yeah, face. before the podcast, I admitted I thought that was Sonny Chiba when I saw the Sonny Chiba credit because I really have no, no knowledge well, of Sonny see, Chiba. Sonny films. Chiba is one of the most recognizable Japanese actors, if nothing else, for those fucking eyebrows, man. Yeah. Those, those angry eyebrows. I don't know. Maybe I've just, I've, like I said, my, my blank spot in Japanese cinema is pretty much anything between 1972 and, and that is when, 13 that is when the Chiba came to prominence. Exactly. In both the States and Japan. So I foolishly thought that was Chiba. Yeah. And I thought that's why I recognized him. But I'm sure I've seen him in so many other things. Well, Sonny Chiba, he's interesting because he's an actor that has primarily been in like genre films. But you can tell, like, he is, he is, like, a really good, very versatile actor. He's played yeah. villains. He's played heroes. He's played, like, bumbling, uh, you know, sub-villains that aren't that important to the plot. He's played bit roles. He's been in starring roles. Well, sure. It's, Just like any good character. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's uh, you know, and, and he has the, he, he can carry a movie, you know. Kind of like the, uh, the Japanese Philip Seymour Hoffman. Yeah, well, except... He's a karate expert, <laughs> right? So if Philip Seymour Hoffman knew karate and and sword fighting and could, uh, I wouldn't shoot, put it past him. Shoot a bow from a horseback. Yeah, that was that was an awesome scene. Yeah. Um, yeah so back to Hunter in the Dark. Oh, also uh, Tetsuro Tamba makes an appearance in this film as uh, he's one of the yakuza bosses. Um, he was actually in that Three Outlaw Samurai movie you mentioned. Okay, yeah. Was he um, the one that uh, gets killed? Right yeah, off the bat. I think. Well, I think so. Um, he he always plays a he 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 generally plays someone who everyone else is like, you know, acquiescing to. Mm-hmm. He's usually a boss or a king or a right. Yeah, I've seen him before. Samurai too. lord. Um, he actually gets assassinated quite a bit in movies. Well, it's, it's, if you could do it well, then yeah. why not do it? But he had a few starring roles in like the '60s, and then later on in life, he he kind of just graduated to this sort of revered character actor. Mm-hmm. And he actually, um, before his death, he died probably around the same time Yoshio Harada did. Well, so was he was he, he was much older. Though. Did he play the the boss that was uh, victim to the triple cross? I think so. Yeah. So, so Gomio Tatsu Nakadai's character hires on this Ronin. And because the third boss, I guess there was three prominent bosses. The first one is the one that this Ronin takes care of at the get-go. Um, so the other two bosses decide to meet to divvy up his former area, his territory. And that's when we find out that this Ronin might not have... Like, he, he was a plant by one of the bosses, not mm-hmm. Tatsu Nakadai, the other one, which is, I think, the character we're talking about. Um, you know, essentially, so Nakadai gets thrown onto the table and then... Um, What's his name? It, it was Tony Gawa? One-Eyed. Our One-Eyed Ronin puts a yeah. sword to his neck. Uh-huh. And you can see Tatsu Nakadai is panicking. And then it turns into a triple cr- cross because yeah. he, he, he takes the sword off of Nakadai and plunges it right into the neck of yeah. the other boss. <laughs> and like really deep through his neck and then pulls it out. Big s- spray of blood. Yeah, and that's kind of a, a succinct a thesis statement for the rest of the movie. It's, it's all about how how honor is kind of illusory and mm. not really as, as important as the culture made it seem at the time. It really... Right. It was it, about who's paying the yeah, most. exactly. And, and that I think that might have been my only issue with the film. Watching it a second time, I was looking for what is this one-eyed Ronin's motivation for the triple cross? He's being paid by the boss he ends up killing. Mm-hmm. Why does he then decide to go against him? Me. Mm. Yakuza movies, I, I don't know. Right, I know. I'm thinking, am I being overly critical? Am I, am I thinking, am I, tr- am I trying to find things that aren't there? Because the first time I watched it, I didn't think anything about it. I was like, yeah. oh, of course, he's triple yeah. crossing. That just makes total sense. But That's maybe, how I kind of felt. but I was, trying to, I was trying to look and see if there's any kind of... Well, actually, how I really felt was like, that's an actor I know and I love. Yeah, doing And that's badass. an actor I know that I love. And, and okay, so he's not going to kill. They're not going to kill each other. Okay, that's good. I'm in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's kind of, that, that was the shallowness of my thought process for that. But, okay, the thing I want to talk about about this movie is the, 
the visuals. All right. Mm-hmm. It, I was struck by just how beautiful this movie was. Like, yeah. in a lot of 70s genre films, you get, like, really beautiful sequences or really beautiful chunks of a movie. But um, especially in movies, like, by Kinji Mizumi, um, who did a lot of the Lone Wolf and Cub films and uh, a couple, I think the first Hansel the Razor movie. Okay. Um, like, you'll get sections of his movies that are really beautiful, but then... There will be other sections where it's it's obviously just kind of tossed off. We have to get this shit out of right. the way so we can get to the stuff I'm really interested in shooting. Exactly. But this, like the whole movie, was like really beautiful and really well cared well for, planned out. Yeah, and I mean it was a studio movie, so it was probably cranked out in a matter of weeks. Mm-hmm. But still, like the the attention to detail, I really liked the the visual style of it. In that it, there was a lot of like telephoto lenses that kind of flattened. Uh, the image, you know, mm-hmm. not not a lot of depth, but it kind of gave it like you're talking about the scroll at the beginning of the movie. It gave, it gave it the feeling of kind of a scroll painting. Yeah, and I think yeah. that was the aesthetic that Gosha was going. For. Yeah, and I mean, uh, I mean, even a lot of the shots are like these tracking shots that scroll mm-hmm. through the image. But also a lot of interesting camera placement, like when uh, Boss Gomio is talking to Chiba's character, the, the corrupt politician, and they're trying to you know figure out where they're going. Yeah, um, there's this interesting shot where. I mean, it kind of breaks that 180 rule where it just flips from one side of the room to the other. And on, on one shot, you see, like, the top two-thirds of their faces, and the rest of the frame is kind of obscured by this this um, screen Yeah, that's in front of them. And then when it's cutting back and forth between them, like, you'll see like so these really awkward framing. Like, you'll see uh, the back of Gomio's head. Mm-hmm. And instead of the prominent two-thirds on the right of him, you see in the very scant one-third to the left of him, like half a Chiba's face. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure that's, you know, intentional oh, yeah. to show like, okay, so Nakadai's probably got the, you know, the cover on this guy. Oh, special but, guest appearance by a fly on the microphone. Yeah, we got a fly on the microphone. Anyway. Kill it. <laughs> Um, yeah, it felt uh, more so than Bandits vs. Samurai Squadron. I feel like watching Bandits vs. Samurai Squadron, that one felt like... Same kind of feel, but that one, I, th- I think it's bigger in scope. Like, it was trying to do a lot more, so mm-hmm. a lot of it felt, like you were saying, a little bit of, you know, awesome set pieces interspersed with ones that you felt like they rushed through. Yeah. This one, I feel like Gosha's honed in. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he wants. And yeah. he's just, he's, it, all of it, all of it's awesome. Yeah. There's, I there's mean, no there fat were, on this film. Exactly. And, in, like, even, like, visual fat, like I was saying. It's, it's all very beautiful. Like, and then there was that scene with the lanterns. Yeah. Yeah. It was just kind of brilliantly staged and, and even though what was happening in the scene wasn't super interesting. The, the police like, raid, just yeah. yeah, just looking at it, you're like, Oh, this is like a fucking living painting. It's beautiful. Yeah. And the uh the outside shots too, um felt like that. You could tell they were on a set, I yeah. think, because the background there was no depth in the background. Mm-hmm. But still, like yeah, felt like paint, oil paint, acrylic paint, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> um and some very, very interesting shots. And then the whole, um, the kind of subplot of our one-eyed Ronin and how he lost his memory mm-hmm. and how that, you know, develops and how you're, you're just, I, I think a, a lot of the reason why I love this film is you, you're not treated like you're stupid as a viewer. Yeah. Like the details come when they're supposed to come. Not like, well, we're going to explain this to you. We're going to hold your hand through all this plot detail. It's like, no, we're just going to throw you into this scenario. Yeah. And you'll figure it out as all the characters do. Yeah. yeah. And um, another note, some really amazing action sequences in here. Yes. Uh, it's not as full bore as like Lone Wolf and Cub 2, Baby Card at the River Sticks. <laughs> Know what I'm talking about? You know, yeah. You know, it's not people getting cut in half like the whole movie. There, are, there is some excellent blood geyser style work. You yep. know, I have this theory that that Japanese people, while they're smaller than Westerners, still have the same amount of blood, so it's pressurized, right? Okay. So if you cut them, you get that. That's that's a good theory. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> um, uh, but there's a there's a couple. Well, there's about three. <clears throat> action scenes that really stuck out for me. One is um, when uh, One-Eye Harada is doing his uh, assassination in that uh, big house with all the paper walls. Yeah. And he just barrels through Which, the walls. And how, how tense is that? Because yeah. you see him, the setup, he's getting prepared. He takes out his, his sword. Yeah. He's looking at the ceiling, just kind of getting a feel for the place. He yeah. pre- places a sword into the floor, just yeah. stabs it, and then he takes out his, his small sword, his short sword. Yeah. And you know he's going to have to come back for that that yeah. long sword. He's going to because 
he knows what he's up against. Yeah. There was a and setup then he just to that. starts barreling through the walls, yeah. and you're like, "Is he lost? Does well, he, he know goes through the first going? wall, yeah. and there's nothing there, and then he just yeah. charges up the next wall, and he goes through another one, and you're like, "What's going yeah. on? Like, and then he goes through. I think it's like ten, ten walls. Yeah. And then finally, he gets the last one, and you see this group of of men that he's going to assassinate start to scramble. Yeah. And it's just bloodshed. The first thing he does is cuts a guy's arm off yeah. at the right below the and wrist. Not, it's not even like a swipe either. He like holds the sword to his yeah. arm and then. Slices. Did you rewind and watch that over yeah. and over? So the the guy he forces the guy's hand up into the ceiling with the sword. So yeah. the sword gets stuck in the ceiling, and then you see the short sword slice the guy's forearm. Yeah. And it's just then the hand remains on the hilt of the sword while the guy falls back, mm. and blood spurts out from the forearm. And it, oh man, I was just like wow. <laughs> And then that he, then so he takes badass. off a leg too before he's done. Yeah. But another scene, the the fight in the burning building. Yes, the um, temple. Yeah. The Japanese are very fond of that. They love to burn shit. Yeah, uh, like uh, there's a movie starring Sonny Chiba. Okay, that came out same period uh, called Samurai Reincarnation. That oh, you've is told well me about this worth one, yeah. checking out. Um, he plays a legendary character Jubei Yagyu, the one-eyed samurai. So, uh, but it's. Anyway, at the end of the movie, he actually has a fight with uh, Thomas Saburo Wakayama, who plays um, uh, Lone Wolf and Cub. Mm. The the main character in Lone Wolf and Cub, his name escapes me right now. But they they have a fight in a burning building at the end of the movie. And it's shot so expertly, because you yeah. know that these actors are working around fire, uh-huh. but I think they're also doing forced perspective. Yeah. So they're not actually yeah, yeah. in any real danger. Yeah. And it was it was kind of an interesting break for me because a lot of the movies I'm used to watching from this period are Kenji Fukasaku movies, and his whole deal is like handheld camera, just like into the fray, you know. So you mm-hmm. get this wild, like disorienting, frantic, yeah. frantic brawl. You know, it's not it's not like expertly staged or anything. Even though that kind of filmmaking has its own, you know, sort of a details you have to pay attention oh, sure, yeah. to yeah when you're dealing with groups but so so it was it was interesting to me to see these these kinds of fights that were staged in in such oh, and choreographed yeah. so well yeah yeah and then uh the the third um was the final showdown between Sonny Chiba and Nakadai yeah in which they uh, have a sword fight in a chicken coop yeah <laughs> that uh, I felt was almost the the director kind of laughing at the ridiculousness of of the their their code of honor or whatever because they 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 both end up spoiler alert they both end up dead in a flurry of chicken yeah. feathers and then there's a helicopter shot yeah. away from them and then it says the end <laughs> it, it, which it, it felt it felt kind of subtly mocking yeah Maybe I, not I, even I subtle. can see that I, I can feel that um, but um, still at the same time it's just I mean kind of, it, Echoing back to Nakadai's fight with that gigantic gangster that was hired by the uh, the widow of the gangster that was yeah. killed by our one-eyed Ronin, um, that was an awesome duel because that's when you you first saw Nakadai. He alluded to his sword play um, earlier when he's first met the one-eyed Ronin, mm-hmm. and their first conversation about like I've never met anyone who studied this form of sword play before. And Nakadai yeah. says, "Oh, I wouldn't consider what I do as is, is you know study. It's just more like you know a, a child with a, a toy yeah. sword or something yeah. like that." But then you see him in action, and he's an expert. Yeah, yeah. he knows what he's doing. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, and then that final battle kind of yeah, I don't know. I, I think it was it was satisfying. Because yeah. in the kind of situation where you've got gangsters versus corrupt politicians, who do you want to see win? Yeah. Neither. <laughs> and that's kind of what happens. Yeah, I mean, um, Japanese film during this period got, like, really bleak with, with their genre films, anyway. Yeah. Um, a lot of... I think it was kind of ushered in by Fukusaku in the earlier 70s with his Yakuza films. Because, like... You find a, a a Fukusaku movie with like a happy ending. It's Rare. I, I I haven't seen one yet, okay. <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, he he kind of like he grew up in post war Japan, you know, around actual yakuza. So it was like what he was seeing in the movies. These honorable guys that were you know fighting for justice and their code of honor. He's like, that's not what happens yeah. <laughs> no and so once he got a little bit of clout in the industry it was like okay i'm gonna make movies about what i experienced growing up kind of so it was all about these just 
anti-hero, you know, dishonorable assholes mm-hmm. just ruining everyone's lives. Yeah, but this this own. is a <laughs> this is not that. And the fact that even though these are all, I guess, quote unquote, bad yeah. people, they're all acting honorably. Yeah, like yeah. Nakadai is almost too honorable to yeah. be a gangster, and. It's also unique in the fact that in most like gangster films or even uh, just Chanbara films I've seen, yeah, you almost feel this air of cowardice about all of the the um, I guess the lackeys mm-hmm. of, the, of the bosses. Like they're just terrified. They're always terrified, and they, they go into battle just like ter- you know, yeah, shaking. And this one, you didn't see any of that. Yeah, everyone was an expert at what they did. Their only problems, their only faults were um, temptations of the flesh. I guess. Yeah. Um, well, from what I understand about Gosha, he's kind of considered a, a like genre stalwart with yeah. like the Yakuza or Samurai movie. Like he he's known as like kind of a staunch traditionalist and like the the mechanics of of the genre. And you could feel that in this movie. Yeah, yeah. but but then he, he like you know the the downbeat ending is kind of a a, a subtle you know. A transgression, I guess. That it felt like at this point in his career, he was trying, like, he was tweaking the formula just a little bit, you know, like, well, like, like an expert sushi chef that spends years like trying to do the same thing super well, and then figures out how to tweak it just a little bit to make it better. Put his own flavor on it. <laughs> yeah, I well, mean, yeah, why not? Because I mean, that's that's kind of the Japanese character, learning how to do one thing really well. You know, Be- being an expert at it, yeah. Yeah, and uh, you know, it, it felt. I, I haven't seen any of his other movies, but that's that was kind of the feeling I got from this one. I I can understand that, understand where you're coming from, but at, at the same time, I think had either one of them survived that last mm-hmm. duel, wouldn't have been as satisfying satisfying a film. Yeah, for me. Yeah, of course I'm 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 bleaky McBleaks a lot, so I, I really like. <laughs> sad downbeat endings and that's one of the reasons that I'm so attracted to this period in Japanese film mm-hmm. well then I would recommend uh, Bandits vs. Samurai Squadron that one's, mm-hmm. that one's really good um, other Gosha films I've seen and one I've recommended to you 1985 it's called Tracked yeah. and it's kind of along that same line we were talking about last week with let's put an empathetic light on a serial killer well yeah. I guess not serial killer but a person who commits murder Yeah, um, and is on the lam and another interesting thing about this movie it was Shochiko Studios, which I don't have a lot of experience with from this period. Like yeah. I saw, I, I mean, that oh, was, I've seen a ton of yeah. 60s. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Same here, but but once they got into like the the genre shit in the 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 seventies and eighties, I I haven't seen a lot of that. I'm I'm mostly I mostly know Toei, Toho, and Kotakawa from this yeah. that period. I've seen so, a ton of Shochiku. Yeah, so I, that was kind of interesting because. I, I get the feeling that much like the different studios in America in like the 30s were known for different styles of films. Like you go, right. if you wanted a gritty gangster movie, you go Warner Brothers, you know. Yeah. Come see you, the new Warner Brothers picture. Yeah, if you wanted a, a swashbuckler, you'd go whoever was employing her. Paramount or yeah. Universal or yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I... I I'm, I'm interested to see more Shochiko films from this era, just so I can compare and contrast. I mean, I guess I've seen a lot of Nikatsu movies, but yeah. by this point, Nikatsu had, had, had switched over completely to, to softcore pornography. Right. Yeah. Pinku. So, Pinku yeah. films. Um, yeah, and you got to see more uh, Gosha films. Like, I know uh, you mentioned Tracked. I forget the name of the actor in that, but one of your favorites. Yeah. Uh, so we might, uh, I might pick that one next. Yeah, um, I think. We'll see. I, I think. Uh, shit, who was he? Was it? <laughs> He's one of my favorite <laughs> actors. I forget his fucking name. Uh, something with an O. o- Ota- Otaka? No. Uh, Kenogata. 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 Yes. Yeah, he's the star of that one. All right. Yeah, and it's see, it's really good. And it, it's it's weird because you don't generally see this in American film, but let's. I'm mean, you're seeing it more and more, like yeah. with film or shows like Dexter. It's yeah, like let's fuck a Dexter. Let's our, we'll have a killer, a murderer, someone who's committed something unthinkable as yeah. our protagonist, and we're going to show him as a person. Yeah. Let's follow him in his, his life and, and show the, the sides of a killer you don't necessarily want to see. Yeah. So, um, I don't know, I think that about wraps that up. Any closing thoughts? Sure. Um, see this. If you like awesomeness, then this is the film for you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great combination of, of, of really brilliant 
thoughtful visuals and and really those like kind of juvenile badass violent scenes yeah which are so so make, badass make samurai movies so fun yeah so, um yeah i could, I could watch this again and again <laughs> De- so definitely good. definitely check it out it's it was great i i i it was a treat for me because it was right right in my wheelhouse um so next week i think what we're going to watch is uh, we're going to take a break from japan for a while skip over to england and check out mike lee's naked because you haven't seen it yet. i have not and that is another one of my absolute favorite movies yeah no, i've been catching up on sat and i hear yeah. you talk about it all the time <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um yeah i guess until next week um uh, we'll uh, we'll talk to you later say good night isaac good night isaac all right